And now it's time for our next speaker, Anders Wikman. Anders is, among other things, co-president of the global think tank Club of Rome and a member of the International Resource Panel. And you are our next keynote speaker. Thank you. Welcome, Anders. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. And I can only agree with uh, the comments made by Professor Sachs, um, both about the need for a plan of action, but also about the need for a economic framework that is fit for purpose and as soon as possible to do away with uh, with all the money in politics but let me add a few dimensions to to this discourse um, if we look back at what we've been doing in europe for the last 20 years <clears throat> we have taken away roughly 20 percent of uh, our emissions territorially and that we've been doing within the present system um, by making it basically a bit more efficient. But to move towards zero in terms of emissions towards the middle of this century will require something totally different. Here we are talking about transformation, not only incrementalism. To cut away a few percentages here and there may be good, but in fact, it can, in some sectors, uh, lock us more in to the present system and structure. So there is a hell of a difference between really moving towards transformation and to do away with 10, 15, 20 percent as we have done in the past. Now, the only area or the only sector where we have seen some transformation is what Jeffrey Sachs referred to. We have seen wind and solar replacing power production increasingly. And that is, of course, very, very positive. But we need to step up investments in the energy field significantly, because we still depend on fossil fuels for roughly 80% of, of the energy mix in, in the world. I guess we would have to invest three to four times more yearly in renewable energy of different kinds to make what we should be doing. Uh, and IRENA, which is the international uh, organization that follows renewable energy developments, came out with a report the other day basically saying if we do this, make these investments, we will also benefit largely by reducing climate risks, but also by having cleaner air and thus also much uh, improvement of health for the populations. Much of what we have done in the energy field is going in the, di the wrong, uh, right direction. But we also need to think about how we produce goods and services, what we produce, mobility and transport, infrastructure in particular, textiles, electronics, and how we till the land, produce the food. And here, as well as in the energy field, we need transformations. And the problem is not only that in all these sectors, we need energy, and mostly today, fossil energy, to make things happen. Fossil materials are also part of the production system. Steel, for instance, in today's technology, you need coal to, to deoxidize uh, the ore and, and, and produce steel. Plastics are made from oil and gas. Textiles, increasingly, are made from polyester and thus from oil and gas. So here we have examples of products and production schemes which have to be totally revamped and rethought. And if we look at basic materials, steel, cement, plastics, aluminium, they make up more or less 20% of carbon emissions in the world. And in the International Resource Panel, which I belong to, we have made a calculation that in the next 20 to 25 years, we will in the world, in particular in developing countries, build as much infrastructure in urban areas that we have done hitherto. And if that takes place with today's technologies and materials, we can forget about the Paris Agreement because the carbon budget will be more or less consumed by those basic materials. Look at textiles, it's another crucial area. We produce more than 100 million tons of textiles each year. Maybe 60% of those end up with consumers, 
The rest, most of it is being destroyed. And yet we consume a lot of land, water, energy and produce carbon emissions. Six, seven percent of carbon emissions are directly or indirectly linked to textiles. So that's another area where we need to rethink and do things in a different way. Electronics is yet another area where less than 20% of the electronic waste is now being recycled or reused, mostly copper and gold. It's an enormous problem. And ultimately, it's about design, how products are designed. If you, if you have a, an Apple computer, for instance, you cannot even change the battery. So that's just an example that those linear flows of products and materials is something we have, to, we have to rethink. Food production is another area where as soon as you put a plow in the soil, you release carbon. And you also uh, contribute to erosion. There are alternatives, but they are not really practiced widely. You can have no tilling, you can have rotational crops, you can have uh, um, uh, deep roots, uh, uh, perennial crops, then you will um, uh, incentivize or you will enhance fertility, enhance the water retention capacity. You will reduce inputs because you need less fertilizer and, and pesticides and you will build carbon in the soil. So that, that's another sector where we need to rethink what we are doing. And when I refer to construction and production systems, there you have, of course, a number of options. One is to move from linear material flows to circular material flows, the so-called circular economy. It's about reuse, it's about recycling, refurbishment, but it's also about longer extend product life and the sharing economy. Here are enormous opportunities, but they will require policy measures to incentivize design for recycling, design for reuse, and they will also ultimately depend on carbon taxes to make it less favorable to use working materials and more favorable to use secondary materials. So I can think of many, many things to do with regard to materials, uh, but unfortunately the policy process is slow. Yet another example is, of course, substitution. You can build high-rise buildings nowadays in wood inst instead of concrete and steel. That's a perfect example. You can, of course, replace um, polyester by uh, materials uh, uh, from, from, from the forests, like viscose. And then you also gain from a climate uh, uh, mitigation point of view. So I've given a, a number of examples uh, and adding to the energy uh, challenge where we need to, to transform uh, our, our systems. And it will not happen by itself. Markets will not do it by themselves. We need clever policy frameworks. And ultimately, we need to put in place a system in the economy which has a better balance between man and nature, between short term and long term, between private consumption and public goods. And I think that's what, what, what uh, Jeffrey Sachs also was aiming at when he referred to the political economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anders. You're a very experienced politician and you had uh, highlighted a lot of the technological and economical uh, solutions here, but what does it actually take to change the mind of a politician? Well, that's a good question. I think one of the basic problems, and, and Jeff referred to it, yeah. is that in many parts of the world there is too much money in politics. Uh, so so that, that is one of the problems. The other one is that the political system is too short term. Mm. Here we are dealing with a lot of long term problems and challenges. And if you have to, to go to the voters every second year or every fourth year, it, it really prevents you from being long term. Yeah. Uh, it, it looks like that at least. So, so the, the, those are two very critical issues. The third one, I think, is that the economy is so short-term. Mm. Um, and the idea that short-term profit maximization for, for all the companies in the world mm. would be compatible with long-term sustainability on the planet, given today's policy frameworks, is ridiculous. So, so we need to look at also the financial system. Uh, and, and, and the way we incentivize long-term yep. thinking and, and acting in the economy. So we need to focus on, the public need to focus on that thing. Thank you very much, Anders. Thank you.
Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree hotter world. Business as usual means about four degrees warmer, which is approximately one ice age in the opposite direction. Based on today's temperatures, we are going to hit two meters of sea level rise, no matter what. We are in a race against time. It takes a double whammy to understand. It takes repeated shocks. We need a global movement that demands real change. We don't have time to speculate. We don't have time is absolutely correct. As we know, we don't have time. There's no more time. Yes, we don't have time. We use the hashtag. We don't have time. We don't have much time. We don't have time to wait.